In addition to the economic advantages Britain received from its technological pioneering, the country's geography was another favorable influence on its economic progress. Britain's iron ore and coal deposits were located near to one another, and both were located near the sea, an enormous advantage over most continental European countries, where even a distance of ten miles between the two minerals was a formidable obstacle to early German industrial development, for example, in an era before railroads reduced the high cost of land transport. In Britain, however, coal could be shipped by water to Scottish ports located far from the coal fields at prices only negligibly different from the cost at nearer ports, while the shipment of coal on land was said to double in price in just ten miles during the pre-railroad era. In those parts of the British Isles without the advantage of coal deposits or ports, industrialization was as handicapped as in other countries. Coal arriving at a Scottish port in the 18th century could sell for about one pound per ton, but the price rose fifty to one hundred percent by the time it reached the interior highlands, where only the wealthy could afford to buy it for heating their homes. More important, the highlands could not participate in the industrialization which turned the lowlands into a predominantly urban society during the 19th century, since the highlands lacked their own coal and it was prohibitively expensive to transport coal there from other parts of Britain. Thus Highland Scots could participate in the modernization process only by moving down to the lowlands, to other parts of the British Isles, or overseas. In doing so, however, they would arrive at their destinations without the kinds of skills, experience, and orientation, the human capital, in demand in industrial societies. The rise of a British iron and steel industry was intertwined with the development of coal mining. The steam engine was first applied to pumping groundwater out of coal mines to enable digging to proceed deeper into the earth, thereby promoting not only the extraction of coal, but with it the production of iron and steel. Then, as the steam engine itself was improved to the point of being a practical alternative to water power for driving machines in factories, the greater stresses on the machinery created by powerful steam engines created a rising demand for iron and steel that could take such stresses better than the wooden machine parts used to transmit water power. Later, as steam engines were further developed to serve as power for railroad locomotives, coal replaced wood as fuel, and iron and steel rails replaced wooden rails. By 1870, the largest number of steam engines were being used in manufacturing, but the largest amount of horsepower supplied by steam engines was in mining, about one-fourth of the total horsepower produced by steam in the country, with textiles next, using nearly one-fifth of the nation's horsepower supplied by steam. The declining demand for wood as fuel and as an industrial material, due to the rise of coal and iron respectively, freed land from timber growing for agricultural production, or allowed it to revert to woodlands. Woodlands in Britain increased in area by more than one-fourth between 1873 and 1911. It was not merely things that developed. People developed. Textile mills began to locate in the vicinity of ironworks, because there one could find skilled mechanics familiar with machinery and able to repair and maintain textile machinery as well as the other machines they dealt with. Engineers and mechanics were as much products of the industrialization process as the material goods and the machinery by which those goods were produced. So were inventors. More patents were issued in the quarter century after 1760 than in the preceding 150 years. British mechanics and engineers were in demand around the world. Many made repeated trips to the new United States of America, where their skills and knowledge were in great demand during the late 18th and early 19th centuries, while others went to various countries in continental Europe or even to Japan. As late as 1876, there were more than a hundred foreign industrial workers in the Japanese railroad industry alone, and of these, 94 were British. In Russia, more than a hundred Scottish industrial workers arrived in St. Petersburg on a single vessel. The movement of skilled artisans was especially important during the early phases of British industrialization, when the predominant form of human capital consisted of individual experience, personal knacks, and trial-and-error methods, rather than the application of science, which would come later. 
Not only did Britons travel abroad to spread industrial knowledge, other countries sent mechanics and engineers to Britain to learn the most advanced information in their fields. These included Americans, Germans, Japanese, and Norwegians, among others. Over time, however, machines made individually by the knack of particular craftsmen began to be replaced during the 1820s to the 1840s by machines made in a standardized manner by machine tools. Using machines to make other machines allowed finer tolerances to be maintained, sometimes down to a thousandth of an inch and this in turn meant that parts could be made interchangeable. Standardized and systematized production of machines also promoted the rise of engineering as a profession for which people could be trained. The export of British technology and the emigration of the people who understood that technology was on such a scale as to cause laws to be passed forbidding both, so as to maintain British preeminence, but such laws proved to be very ineffective. However, it was 1825 before these laws were repealed. None of these developments occurred with the kind of suddenness or pervasiveness suggested by the phrase industrial revolution, but the profound depth and eventually far-reaching scope of these incremental changes certainly deserved that title. Life would never be the same again, either for Britain or for the world. For example, Englishmen introduced railroads to the rest of the world not only by the example of railroad building in their own country, but also by themselves building and manning the first railroads in Germany, Argentina, India, Russia, Uganda, Kenya, and Malaya, as well as financing the building of railroads in the United States, France, and elsewhere. Railroads, in turn, were revolutionary in their social consequences. The concentrations of the world's populations along coasts and near rivers was reduced as land transport into interior hinterlands became cheaper. This was even more of a factor in countries with large landlocked interiors, such as Germany, the United States, and Russia, than in England itself. It has been said that the characteristic feature of nineteenth-century economic development was the development of continents instead of coastlines. Germany in particular was freed from its dependence on North Sea ports, which could freeze over in the winter, and became instead a hub of railroad networks that stretched across Europe. As a nation located in the center of the continent, Germany could, for example, ship its own and other countries' goods in all directions, establishing rail links that ultimately reached the Mediterranean and through it the Middle East. Inside Germany, Railroads made it economically feasible to bring the iron ore of Lorraine to the coal fields of Westphalia, enabling Germans to become major producers of steel, and with it one of the leading industrial powers of the world. One indication of the historic role of the British in bringing railroads to Germany is that, of the 240 locomotives in Germany in 1840, 166 came from England. In the United States as well, the coming of the railroad age permitted separate deposits of iron ore and of coal to be brought together for the production of iron and steel, the ore from the vicinity of Lake Superior, for example, being transported by rail to the coal deposits near Pittsburgh, which became one of the great iron and steel producing centers of the world. The British role in the world's shipping was no less dramatic. In addition to inventing the steam engine that facilitated massive international emigration and made possible the international shipment of bulky and relatively low-valued commodities such as wheat, the British built many of the world's transoceanic ships, in addition to carrying much of the world's international commerce in British ships, for other countries as well as for themselves. As late as 1912, Britain carried more than half the goods shipped across the seas of the world. In addition, British shipyards built more than half the tonnage of steamships used by France, Russia, Spain, Holland, Italy, and Belgium. The revolution in transportation created by the railroad and the steamship affected not only industry and commerce, but also the lives of millions of ordinary people. As late as the mid-nineteenth century, only the affluent could afford such things as tea, coffee, sugar, raisins, oranges, and cocoa— but cheap transportation made all these things available to the masses. Perishable commodities, like fish, could now be sold internationally, when swift and cheap transportation on the high seas was combined with refrigeration en route. Thus English fish was sold in Switzerland, and even Canadian salmon was sold on the European continent. 
Not only things, but people moved more readily, some for permanent settlement abroad, but many to work just for a season in agriculture or in the building trades before returning home. Thousands of Russians went to Germany when it was time to harvest crops there, just as Italian agricultural workers went to Argentina for their harvest, and Italian buildings trades workers traveled seasonally to the United States. Transatlantic travel became quicker, cheaper, and safer. The horrendous death rates from crossing the Atlantic in the era of wind-driven ships were drastically reduced, partly because steel steamships do not sink as often as wooden sailing ships, and partly because the much shorter times spent on the water subjected people to fewer danger of debilitation and illness. Steamships also largely rid the seas of the centuries-old worldwide scourge of piracy, for steamships were too expensive for freebooters to finance, and sailing ships could no longer suffice to enable pirates to catch steamers. Moreover, steamships required ports where they could refuel with coal, and pirates could hardly expect to obtain this service from their potential victims. At the heart of the industrialization process was iron and steel, and Britain was preeminent in their production. As of 1830, the production of pig iron in Great Britain was nearly double that in Germany and France combined. As of 1871, the British produced more steel than Germany, France, Sweden, and Austria combined. British agriculture was also acknowledged to be the best in the world. Britain likewise spearheaded the development of the modern textile industry, supplying not only the major inventions, but also initially the managers and skilled labor needed to train foreign workmen to operate British-made machinery in Russia, China, India, Mexico, and Brazil. British firms also dominated the production of mining and other heavy equipment in late 19th and early 20th century Chile. In short, British technology and British capital were transplanted and took root around the world, in Africa, Asia, and Latin America, as well as in such offshoots of British civilization as the United States, Canada, and Australia. Partly as a result of a massive shipment of capital goods, British exports in the early 1870s exceeded the exports of the United States and Germany combined. The effect of early 19th century industrialization on the standard of living of ordinary working people in Britain is a question long shrouded in controversy. However, what is clear is that industrial regions of Britain attracted large numbers of people from the countryside and from smaller towns, that the wage rates paid in industrial centers were higher than in rural areas, and that consumption patterns indicate that these higher wages were not simply dissipated in meeting higher costs of living in the cities, but represented a real increase in what people could afford to buy. High death rates in large industrial centers were a sobering reminder of the negative aspect of industrialization, as accidents, overcrowding, with accompanying vulnerability to endemic and epidemic diseases, and perhaps the congregation of people from different disease environments with different levels of resistance to one another's disease, all added to the hazards. Nevertheless, these hazards were known at the time to the people who moved to the cities, so their choices to move there suggested what their trade-offs were. Moreover, the overall death rate in Britain changed very little from 1820 to 1870 because increasing lifespans in the rural areas offset the higher death rates in urban areas. The rising wealth of the country, deriving from industrialization, may well have contributed to the increasing life expectancy outside the urban industrial centers themselves. The longer-run effects of industrialization on living standards in Britain were even more clearly positive. Even Karl Marx, who spent more than three decades living in Victorian England, acknowledged the rise in British workers' living standards between the 1840s and the 1860s. Although the question as to why England became the standard-bearer in the advancement of human economic and technological achievements in the world may never be fully answered, its location, institutions, and social practices were all conducive to this result, though clearly not determinative as shown by the long centuries during which Britain lagged behind continental Europe and other parts of the world. However, during the era when European civilization emerged as the most economically and technologically advanced in the world, Britain had the advantage of being able to share in that civilization, 
while being an island nation spared the country the direct ravages of the wars that repeatedly disrupted and devastated the continent. Even when the British took part in these wars, they fought on other people's territory or at sea. Internally, both the political system and social practices were also favorable to economic development. Stability of government and laws, and security of property, made it possible to raise vast aggregations of capital from the public at low interest rates for projects that took decades to complete, such as canals and railroads. The long-term interest rate in Britain was 6% at the beginning of the 18th century, and fell to 3.5% by mid-century. Social factors were also favorable in England, where the prosperous and educated classes were a functional factor in commerce and industry, as well as in agriculture, letters, law, and politics. In Scotland as well, land ownership might be crucial for entry into the upper classes, but did not preclude careers in law or commerce. For all the snobbishness of British society, its aristocracy was not sealed off from the mundane, practical, economic concerns of the nation, as were those of many other societies, where an hereditary aristocracy hindered or stifled the spirit of enterprise, thereby holding back national economic development. Moreover, the rise of the gentry and the decline of the nobility in Tudor times, and the intermingling of these gentry with people of the commercial class, meant that gentlemen in Britain could also be businessmen, and vice versa, making not only the wealth but the talents of the more fortunate classes available for the economic development of the country. The younger son of the Tudor gentleman was not permitted to hang idle about the manor-house, a drain on the family income, like the impoverished nobles of the continent who were too proud to work. He was away, making money in trade or in law. Among those of the landed gentry who remained on the land, the enterprising spirit of improvement was also apparent. New crops, new agricultural methods, and new techniques in animal husbandry were widely introduced by landowners in England. As new methods of raising feed for animals made it easier to keep them alive over the winter, the widespread and almost automatic slaughter of animals in the autumn ceased, leading to a year-round supply of fresh meat that changed the English diet, greatly reducing diseases growing out of the heavy salting of meat that had formerly been necessary when far more meat was slaughtered than was needed at one time and had to be stored. By the eighteenth century, England was one of the leading nations of Europe in agricultural technique and in the commercial development of farming, as distinguished from the feudal serfdom of Eastern Europe or the small peasant farming of much of continental Western Europe. At the lower end of the social scale, as well as among the gentry, enterprise and social mobility were part of the pattern in England. Most hired farmhands, for example, did not live out their entire lives in that role, but usually moved on to other occupations after marriage. Moreover, people in a wide variety of roles on the land, great landlords, small owners, tenants, and hired hands, all produced for the marketplace. The number of people in the agricultural population grew absolutely with the growth of population in general, though their proportions declined as the country industrialized. Around the middle of the 19th century, the total number of people working in British agriculture reached its peak at two million, constituting just under one-fifth of the total population of the nation. As the number of farmers began to decline, total agricultural output continued to rise for some time, due to increased productivity, but the share of agriculture in Britain's total output declined to just 6% by the first decade of the 20th century. By this time, however, Britain was importing more than half of its beef, mutton, and lamb, and three-quarters of its wheat. Other nations had some of the advantages of England, but none combined them all. Germany had large iron ore and coal deposits, but not as close together as in England and the numerous tariff barriers between the disunited German states and principalities before the formation of their customs union in the early nineteenth century were economically crippling. France was lacking in iron ore, and, like Germany, had no such advanced financial institutions as England's to finance industrialization. Even a French entrepreneur who developed the first successful machine for spinning linen yarn in the late eighteenth century went to England to get financing for his venture, because he could not raise the needed capital in France. Scottish inventors, including James Watt, 
likewise sought financing in England to produce their inventions commercially. France had the intellectual foundations for modern industry without the commercial and financial complements. French chemists, such as Lavoisier, Berthollet, and Leblanc, made fundamental contributions to the development of modern chemistry, but here, too, what they contributed was then commercially applied first in England. With its take-off into the industrial age, England emerged from centuries in the shadow of continental European powers, and left a lasting imprint on the world, greater than that of any other nation since the days of the Roman Empire. Indeed, the worldwide scope of the British impact was far beyond anything possible in Roman times. However, having set in motion the Industrial Revolution and spread its technology worldwide, Britain in the last decades of the nineteenth century was faced with the international competition of rapidly growing industrial rivals. As of 1870, Britain produced 32% of all the manufactured goods in the world, followed by the United States at 23%, and Germany at 13%. By 1913, however, Britain's relative share of the world's growing supply of manufactured goods was down to 14%, exceeded by Germany at 16%, and by the United States at 36%. This loss of world leadership in industrial output was perhaps inevitable, given that Germany, the United States, and other industrializing nations had much larger populations than Britain. However, Britain was overtaken not only in gross output, but also in output per worker. It lost its lead in technological innovation. After producing more than 40% of all the major inventions, discoveries, and innovations in the world from 1750 through 1825, Britain found its relative share declining and ultimately being surpassed by the shares of Germany and the United States. By 1950, Britain's share was down to 3% and that of the United States was 82 percent. In short, British inventiveness and efficiency did not keep pace. One factor in the loss of British economic preeminence in the world was Britain's earlier development of strong and widespread labor unions, which were able to restrict the application of new technology, both directly and by appropriating a sufficient share of technology's economic benefits to reduce the incentives for further technological investment. In the United States, by contrast, industrial labor unions did not become dominant in the major industries until the late 1930s. An ironic consequence of this difference in industrial unionization was that much British labor and British capital moved to the United States, where both were more productive than they were at home. Other factors in Britain's relinquishing its economic and technological lead include a failure to standardize its products to the extent that German, American, or Canadian firms did, and a neglect of technical education. Despite Britain's dependence on exports, it often failed to adapt its products to foreign tastes, or their marketing to foreign languages, or even to quote export prices in foreign currencies, rather than in the complex system of British shillings, pence, and pounds sterling, that existed before British money was put on the decimal system in the late 20th century.